Okay, we're going. Okay, thanks everybody for coming tonight. Um, this is a little bit weird for me. I do presentations and such, but it's a little bit weird because I can't see anybody. So um, I know you're all out there. I'm gonna just try to visualize an audience and um, I wish I could see everybody. It would make it a little more uh, personal, but um, I've got a presentation worked out and it's called uh, Animal Tracks in the Snow. And hopefully that is why you're here because if you're not here to learn about animal tracks in the snow, you're either gonna leave or, or hopefully you will leave because otherwise you're gonna be, uh, you're gonna be probably bored to death, but I don't know. We're gonna cover a lot of stuff in a short period of time. I probably have more material than I can get at. So some of it I'm gonna go over pretty quickly, but uh, my goal, is tonight because this is an hour and you'll see um, there's no way to learn all this in an hour so what I'm gonna try to do is like inspire you and provide you with some tools so that you can go out on your own and learn this stuff on your own and give you a pathway to discover what is out, what is out there um, because it can be really challenging as we will see so <clears throat> I put a slide in here this is just from a book, a really good book by John Valant. It's called The Tiger, The Tiger. And um, it's just a, it's a really cool book that interweaves tracking um, within the story about uh, Far East Russia. If you haven't read it, it might be a good read for you. But it's basically about people's ability to read stories in the snow and how fundamental that used to be for everybody um, for their survival and livelihood. Um, it's not so much anymore, but uh, in some places it is though. <clears throat> so why do we want to look at this stuff um, to give us a sense of place because um, we're all out there and there's things happening all around us every time all you if you all go out and uh, enjoy the outdoors there's so much happening out there that you're missing if you can't read stories in the snow um, so that's one way biologists use track data as well uh, people can use it for hunting and also for staying safe. Uh, for example, I just today I was out in the back where I live and I noticed moose calf and cow tracks all over the place and I could tell they were fresh. I knew which way they were going so I was very aware of the situation and kept my guard up just in case and I did run into those animals as well but I, I knew they were there somewhere um, so that was a that was a benefit on my for me. Um, <clears throat> okay so animal tracks in the snow. I am gonna start out right off the bat with a little chat reply, I believe so, right? Yeah, this will just be a chat. There's two animals in this image right here, and I'm not a big fan of just saying things with imagery, but, uh, or trying to guess tracks from a picture, but there's two tracks here, right from the Fairbanks area, right at the end of my road, actually. And I wanna do a little assessment here and see what people think these two animals might be. So just go ahead in the chat room if you have an idea, what do you think these two animals are? And I think it's, I don't know if it's anonymous or not. <clears throat> Aha. Aha. Oh, okay. Aha. <clears throat> All right, we're getting a lot of different things here. And this is a tough one because one thing that we're missing here is um, size. We have no scale. So I can, I'll tell you right now, these are all, all these tracks are about an inch and a half. That might give you a better, um, <clears throat> a better idea. But even without that, and I was actually kind of surprised to see one of these. I, I actually saw one of these and I was surprised um, that it was there because it was in the in a forested area. Okay. Okay, we got a, a whole wide variety of answers. Some of them are right. I I would exclude the Bengal tiger because that that track is about as big as one toe of a Bengal tiger. So, <clears throat> all right, close. Okay, so here we go. Um, what do we got here? We have a ptarmigan and a house cat. So if anybody has a house cat and if you're really into tracking, you would look at your house cat tracks all the time and they're very distinctive. Um, they're very round. They have a very distinct way of walking 
And then this ptarmigan, notice it has a much shorter stride on it. It's got these bird-like toes. So people were really close. I think the only thing was, uh, some people said a, a, tar a grouse, which is close. And um, the cat's a tricky one because it's not a wild animal. So I threw, I threw a little trick one in there. <clears throat> um, that was just a little warm up. So introduction to me, my name's Mike Terrace and I work for Department of Fish and Game doing wildlife education, outreach, communication stuff for interior in North uh, East Arctic, Alaska. And I'm um, tracking isn't part of my job, but I'm, I, I um, spend a lot of time doing it on my own and some for work also. Um, so <coughs> I, I basically, uh, put a lot of time and energy into it. I travel all over the country to do track evaluations and even so much as to go to Africa to practice tracking animals over there, taking evaluations there. I've also been certified as a, a search and rescue tracker. Um, not sure why, but it just has been part of my life for a long time. So, um, and I, of course, being here, I study tracks in the snow a lot because we have so much winter time. Um, and that's a really good thing for me to do in the winter time. So that's what I do. Um, this here, just this picture here with my pointer, that we were um, tracking, we're trailing or f tracking rhino, rhinos in South Africa. This is a rub of a rhinoceros right here. That's the top of the rub where the mud from them rubbing up against the tree. So if you can imagine how big these things are. It's hard to picture that without seeing these, seeing them in real life. Okay, <clears throat> I want to give a shout out to um, Cyber Tracker Conservation. And before we get started, because this organization um, brought this whole evaluation system for tr evaluating trackers, um, giving objective evaluation to tracker skills. And when I discovered this program and got involved with them in the US and in Africa, it was, it was basically life-changing for um, tracking skills. You know, the level of tracking with these people was so high and so elevated that um, once I got involved with them, it definitely made a, a huge improvement in myself. Um, so anybody can go to these things. They have evaluations for anybody. You don't have to be an expert tracker. There's all levels to these um, evaluations, but they're basically a learning experience for a couple of days, you go out and you go out in the field with trackers and evaluators and they ask you questions about everything to try to assess where you're at with your tracking skills. And in the process of doing that, you learn a phenomenal amount. It's a, a really good way to uh, better yourself as a, track, a tracker, yeah. So um, then there's two components because I, because I will talk like sometimes I'll talk about track um, track identification, and then sometimes I'll use the word trailing. And trailing is actually, track, track identification is just seeing the track and knowing what made it. Like these Junko tracks right here um, with the wing marks, um, that's just be able to identify tracks. Trailing is the ability to follow an animal through, through any terrain or anywhere and follow it and try to find it. So I could use both of those terms just so you know the difference. Um, and the, both of these are pretty important to an overall tracker, both of these skills. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna give you an example, just to get started now about tracks in the snow. This is called Death on the Tundra. And I, the reason I'm doing this one is because this is happening all over the place. And this is just on a trail out in uh, Kramer's Refuge. And I was fat biking along this trail and I saw this whole scene, like all this whole scene is in one picture. And I was like, whoa. And I, I was like, oh my God, I can't believe this. And I stopped my bike and I got off and I was like, oh, I got to get some pictures of this. And you may look at it and go like, why do you want to get pictures of that? It doesn't look like anything. But what I see in here um, is a whole lot of different things going on. And you got to notice that the if I didn't notice the different, the, the different things, I wouldn't stop. I just be like, oh, that looks just like a bowl running across the meadow right here. So I see these tracks here. These are very small, very consistent spacing between them. There's a bowl running. It's, it's basically bounding across the snow. But then I look in here and I see this and I, you see the big spaces in between here. This is not a bowl. 
And you see these little drag marks here? This is not a bowl. So, but they're converging on each other. And then I see this trail back here, and it's also very different. So I have to stop, and I'm like, what is going on here? So at the terminus of this, all the scene, I see this big disturbance, and I look at the tracks coming in, and I figured out pretty quickly that a vole came out of its tunnel on the, underneath the snow, and it made a big wide loop around this berm. At, right behind it, a least weasel came bounding out, and it bounded across the snow, and it cut, you can see them converging right there, it cut it off, and this trail right here, notice it's different than both of these, and that is because that is the least weasel with this big bowl hanging out of its mouth, and it's bounding back into this hole with this big fat bowl hanging out of its mouth. So this is where it actually, where they met, and it captured it right here. It probably jumped on it, tried biting it in the back of the neck, and then they rolled, you can see a little bit of struggle ensued, and then the, that weasel dragged that bowl right back to where they came from. So I thought that was pretty cool. That was, that was pretty, that's a pretty dramatic scene, although it's on a smaller scale than you know other big carnivores. Um, it's still the same thing though. Uh, so for those of you that aren't aware, of, of there's a lot of stuff going on underneath the snow. It's called the subnivian area, the subnivian zone. Lots of animals are living under that, that snowpack where it's a lot warmer. And there's some space under there um, <clears throat> where the earth warms up the snow a little bit. So there's all kinds of activity going on in there with voles and shrews and ermine and least weasels. And sometimes they come to the top and this, they show us their tracks and sign as well. So in case you haven't seen one, this is a least weasel. We have a lot of members of the weasel family. This is our smallest one. I think it's the smallest carnivore in North America as well. And if you look at over here, this weasel, um, this least weasel, that is probably a small, a smaller one, probably a female, but that is a, a redback bull. So just to give you an idea, this thing killed that and then it bounded away with it in its mouth. There's no way that thing's not gonna drag in the snow. And then for further reference, this is a shrew right here to show you how tiny a shrew is. And this is a moose nugget, just to have some kind of comparison to that. And these tracks right here are a close up of a least weasel and um, bounding in the snow. I'll show you a little bit more about that later, like how, you, how do you identify those? So, Tracking um, with some of the trackers that I've hung around with and mentors, they have likened tracking to developmentally to reading and the learning letters and putting them together to make words and sentences and then paragraphs and stories. And I kind of like that analogy because uh, there's a lot of truth to it what, from what I see. Um, you really have to learn the basic things first before you can start interpreting anything that's out there. And um, there's conceptions out there, you know, people think like, oh, you're either a tr good tracker, or you're not, you either know this stuff or you don't, but that's really not. It's very, very much like any um, long-term study like martial arts. You really have to start with the basics and build yourself up over time. And if you ever want to get a black belt, if there is, there, there probably are some uh, uh, similar, you know, similar certifications and tracking to that. Um, but it takes a long time and a lot of practice in order to do that. So it's not just something that's magical and you just know all the stuff. Uh, so learning, the, first you got to learn the alphabet. And the alphabet can start out as individual tracks. Like what are these tracks? How do I identify these tracks? And this, I'm going to show you an example of that. Try to run you through the scenario. These are wolf tracks. They're very large canine. They have all this canine um, shape and form to them. Um, this is out in the White Mountains here, outside of Fairbanks. So there's, and then there's letters, and then there's words, like if you're driving along the trail and you see something in, this is in the snow, I see an animal bounding into the deep, like four or five foot powder of snow. Um, okay, that's a word. Um, 
but I also ask myself, why would it, why is it doing that? Because it doesn't want to do, it doesn't just do that for fun of it. Um, or maybe sometimes they do, but uh, they don't, they don't want to burn up all that energy bounding through the deep snow for anything. So what do you do? You go follow them and you look for more words to make up your sentences. And maybe you find a big giant area like the size of a football field beaten down with fresh wolf tracks um, with no scats or anything in this area. And then after looking around, you see this exit area with lots of wolves bounding through the deep snow. And you follow that and eventually find a convergence of wolves. And you find this path that is basically hard as a rock now because it's been walked down by so many wolves. Uh, maybe you see some raven wings here and some fur that have been flown around and scavenged. And you follow that and you're putting words now, you're developing sentences and um, making actually by now paragraphs until you find like the culmination of the story um, and you realize that the story is that there were wolves coming down this trail or some wolves found this moose. They got all the other wolves together into an area and then they went and they hunted this wolf, this moose down and killed it and they ate it and they bedded down. They, they had a lot of moose bed or uh, wolf beds around. It's also been scavenged by a lot of birds as well. Um, so that's all just developing a story out of finding one little track and just pursuing it a little bit. So how the question is, how do we get to this point? Um, and there's a few things, you know, one of them is um, you have to be inquisitive and or you may as well just forget about it because if, if you look at something and you're not inquisitive and don't want to know what it is, you'll never, you know, you'll never be motivated to seek out an answer for it. So you have to want to know what things are and you have to be inquisitive to, and go pursue it. Um, another thing is you really have to build your um, naturalist database because you can see all these things in the ground. And if you don't know what's there to begin with, if you don't know what the possibilities are, you have nothing to pull from. You, you could just sit there forever and just be like, I have no idea. And, and so you have to learn everything possible about nature that you can in your environment. And um, in by and large, wherever I travel and do any kind of tracking stuff, the people that are there, the, the good trackers are very skilled naturalists as well, which is pretty awesome because you can, you can do bird stuff and mammal, and, and, you know, pretty much anything. There's somebody there that knows um, little bits and pieces of everything out there. So it's a good learning experience. Um, <clears throat> hang around with skilled people, look for mentors to help you. Um, and also just, you know, use all of your, all of your senses, you know, it's not just about looking on the ground and looking at tracks. There's many, many instances of using other skills like bird language and listening to birds and bird calls and bird alarms and that really help out with a lot of things in the tracking realm. So all your senses, smell, um, yeah, just really heightening your observation skills. So some resources to do some of these things. Um, I would say there's a lot of books out there and I would say all of them are probably valuable, valuable in one way or another. So the, the best full, like full on resource guides that I know of today and that I definitely recommend are um, the tracking books from Mark Elbronk. They're very thorough. They have everything in there from bird nests to all different kinds of scat um, tracks, uh, many, many, many things. So, um, and there's these other books um, about actually, this is a book about actually following animals, you know, books about human tracking are also, I find very valuable as well. Um, and if you uh, want to get a good app, there's the one professional app that I know of for tracking is called I Track Wildlife by Jonah Evans. And it's a very high quality phone app that has a lot of stuff on there. Um, so I would recommend that as well. Sometimes I look in like several different references just to um, answer some questions sometimes that I might have. So don't restrict yourself, but we also have this track card that you can have and put in your wallet or your pocket or whatever. 
And you can get this free on our website, on our education website. And I, <clears throat> Jen's gonna post a link to that. And this is really simple, but at least it has the sizes of the animal tracks and everything. Um, so snow tracking, it's also, it's referred to also as simple tracking because you can see things happening in the snow. Like following a moose without snow is, is a little more complex. Following it in the snow is, should be considered simple because you can very easily see every track that this animal's making. Um, and then you could see here where it's bedded down. Uh, so it's really visible, but uh, does that make it easy? And I would, sim I would just say I'll write no because um, snow can actually make things a little more challenging. It makes it easier to follow something, but answering questions and identifying the actual animal itself can, can be more difficult. So, um, and here, for example, which is one, one reason we're gonna learn animal gates tonight is because a lot of times in our snow, all you see is gates. You don't see good tracks because of the conditions of snow. Um, it may be really dry and powdery, and especially in the interior, you, don't, you may not see any tracks at all, many feet. Here's an example. Here's an animal walking in the snow. There's one good track right there, but all the other ones break through the top, the thin crust in the top, and then they don't leave much of a track on inside there because of the powdery snow. Um, then there's this animal here. Much longer stride, right? Both of them are walking animals. So we'll see later how we could figure that out. And this happens to be a lynx on this side here. If you were thinking that, you're correct. And this side here is a moose, right? Going, both of these are going up the camera as well. And this picture here, this is actually a really nice uh, lynx track, but it just didn't make much of an impression. But you can see a toe, a toe, a toe, a toe, and their little pad that's covered. Why do they, they sometimes make not great impression? Because this is the this is a lynx foot. This is the bottom of a lynx foot. Can everybody see that? You see any toes in there? <laughs> they're in there, but they're covered in thick, thick fur. So they don't always just they don't always push through that thick fur, especially in the proper snow condition. But you should be able to notice that if you're really like super uh, a super good observer. And then it depends on the snow characteristics, as we'll see. And this is an interesting one because some people say like, oh yeah, I know, I know all my tracks, you know, but the, the conditions change. There's an infinite variety of snow conditions, you know, maybe not infinite, but a lot. And every time the snow condition changes, the appearance of the tracks change. Not only that, when the snow conditions change, animals might change their gait and have a completely different look of their um, track pattern may look completely different. This is a Martin track in hard, a dusting of snow on a hard trail. Notice this gate, there's a front foot, um, front foot, hind, front foot, hind foot, front foot, front foot, hind foot, hind foot, all, all together in here. And that's about, they're doing this, uh, it's called a three by lope. And when the snow gets deep, they change into like a two by lope where they're only, they're basically like acting like a slinky and only showing two feet showing up in the track. So they change a lot and you have to be aware of that. So if you don't know your tracks to begin with and you don't know your track patterns, the snow is not gonna make it any more easy. And it may in fact make it more challenging. Just a couple of trails here, this that you should start getting an eye for. These are ermine tracks right here. And if you all know what an ermine is, you saw that least weasel. An ermine is it's the, the next bigger weasel that we have. Here's that least weasel. This is an ermine. So bigger, they turn white in the winter. Um, and they're all over the place. This is another one on their trail. When they bound, they often drag a little bit and they leave this like, people call it a The host muted me. Sorry, Mike, that was, I was trying to admit somebody. Keep going. Okay, plus, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yes. you can? 
Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so uh, th- this is our this is our, another ermine trail, and it's just it goes on and on. And um, I, this here is um, a little bit different. This is a walking animal. You can see the feet in there, but they're they're sunk into the snow, so you can't really see a track. But you see this thing that this center drag down the center. Just by that alone, knowing there's a trough here, um, even I don't know the size of that, so it will be a little bit of a challenge, but I can tell because of that tail drag that it's a muskrat drag, like pushing itself through the snow. Okay. Uh, let's see. So, for a species ID, um, and you want to figure out what animal is out there. Sometimes it's easy. And like I say, like if you're on a snow machine trail and you get a good tr- clean track and some soft, this wolf track um, went into some soft or some a little bit of overflow and you got a nice perfect wolf track in the ice. Um, and then sometimes there's just a big disturbances in the snow and you have to know from experience what those, what created those. And there's two different animals here. Here's that ermine again, a big ermine. And right next to it is a moose walking through the deep snow. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, um, the track morphology here. That's something that you can do on your own. But I do want to point out when you do see tracks in, and you can actually make out the track itself, the things that you're looking for are the, uh, the size of the track, the overall shape of it. Is it oval or is it round? Is it symmetrical? You got to look at the toes, how many toes, the shape of the toes. Um, does it have nails? The, um, the space between the pads, the in between the digits itself. Um, and all of these things, and particularly the shape of this, um, this carpal pad, because all family groups have different shapes to that pad. So all of those are little clues that will help you to figure things out. Um, and there, every family has specific characteristics to them that we'll look at here. Every, between bears and the cat family and the canine family, they all have characteristics that will help us to narrow things down. And looking at gates now, why do we want to look at gates? Because one, you can tell what animal is out there just by seeing the gate, if you know the gate of the animal. But two, you can interpret the behavior of that animal by looking at the gait, because all animals change their gait depending on what they're doing, and then they leave a different track pattern in the snow. And this is a good example right here, if you see my pointer. This is, this is actually a canine, and right now it's in a side trot, which it's kind of like that crab um, trot that your dogs, if you ever see your dog do when it's looking in one direction off to the side, it's doing a crab little uh, side trot. Then it changes, distinctly changes right here into this little pounce, a pounce, and then a leap in the big tail drag right here. And then it dives down into the snow. And that, of course, is a fox that's hunting. And it obviously heard a bull under the snow right here. And it did its little fox pounce. And in, even in this one, you can see it pounce there. Probably didn't get it because it pounced again over this way and then another pounce here where it smashed its feet and his face into the snow. So knowing these gates are pretty important um, if you're going to learn about tracks in the snow. And the most common gates that we have, uh, we have walks and trots and that includes members of the deer family um, like moose and caribou, um, dogs, cats, bears big rodents, they all, they all have some kind of walking or trotting pattern. And um, there's different pat, there's different gates that are employed. One of them is just a standard walk or a trot. And in the snow, you're only, you're going to see one track on each side. So, but, so imagine animals have four feet. So you have to realize that when the, fr- the left foot steps here, the left front foot, if there's only this pattern with one track on each side, then the hind foot lands there as well. And then the right front foot lands here. But then as the animal moves forward, 
the right hind foot lands in the same place. So that is called a direct register walk. And lots of animals do that um, in the snow, even if they don't do it other times. Um, okay, even though it didn't, they don't, they don't do it other times on the ground, hard ground, they do it in the snow to save energy. So look for that pattern. If um, when they start going a little faster, they can either do an overstep walk or an overstep trot. And when you see that pattern, you'll see the hind foot land in front of where the front foot was. So it's just a little bit of a faster speed, whether it's a trot or a walk. And animals that do this on the hard ground may not do that in the deep snow. Lynx usually do overstep walk. Bears do an overstep walk. Porcupines do an overstep walk, but they don't do it when the snow is deep. Um, and then something like this, if the hind foot is falling behind the front foot, that is a very slow and cautious walk, or it might be even a stalk, like a stalking pattern. And, but that's called an understep walk. So this is a poll, Jen. I would like you to just take a minute and look at these and decide what number one and two are. Um, what kind of gait or what kind of track pattern is being left on the ground here that tells you what gait it is? You can also take a minute to stretch and get up. We'll give everybody like a full minute to answer. Yeah, is there anything so far that anybody needed or? Oh, the, the H and the F means hind and front, foot, sorry. Okay, you got it, all right. Wow, <laughs> wow, we got a lot of trackers out there. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. All right, I'll get everybody a few more seconds to answer yeah. before I cut it off. Okay. Yeah, and the gates, um, they're very challenging. They're not the most exciting thing to present on or learn, but um, they're so important. I can't um, overstate that, how important they are in, our, in the snow. Really, really important to learn the gates. All right, I'm gonna end. You can drive down the highway and look out the window and know what kind of animal it is just by looking at, by knowing the um, track patterns that they're leaving. <clears throat> okay, so we do have the majority or uh, the uh, large number of people um, and a correct. And we have a direct register walk here with, this is actually a lynx in a direct register walk. There's the left side of the body, the right side, the left side, the right side, left side, right side, all evenly spaced apart. So that shows me that it's either a walk or a trot. And um, I know that that is a walk, but well, mostly because lynx usually walk in the, the stride is short enough that it doesn't indicate that it's in a trot. And then the other one is correct if you said overstep walk. This is uh, brown bears, to a, a, a sow and a cub. And if you look, exclude this track right here because it's uh, out of sequence there. But this is a front foot and then the right hind foot landing far above, far in front of it. Left, uh, front left foot and then the hind left foot landing above it. So. Basically those animals, are, they got longer legs and they're just taking a long stride when they walk and they're overstepping their front feet when they do that. Okay. All right, I'm gonna close that out, Jen. Okay, and then we get to lopes and gallops. And this, in, in lopes and gallops, um, there's an airborne phase to them and um, the each foot is land is landing independently, but they're landing in rapid succession to one another, kind of at a in a in a rhythmic pace. 
Um, and it gets pretty technical. I won't even get into it, but the difference between lopes and gallops depends on where the feet are landing next to each other. Um, and that's not really critical right now. I just want you to know that when you have lopes and gallops, you have a group of tracks all together in one bunch, and then you'll have a big space and another group of tracks, a space and another group. And so this picture right here is a, um, this is a Martin and a two by two lope. And it's just called that because you only see two feet landing, but the two front feet are landing. And then as the hind feet are coming in, the, the front feet are launching off again. So that's why they call it a two by lope, just because you see two tracks there. And um, lopes and gates are important to be able to identify and distinguish them from uh, other um, gates. And then of course, this is just a dog in a gallop. And you know it's a gallop because there's a front foot here and a front foot here. And the hind feet are landing way up in front of the, in the front feet. So if you look and picture that with your dog, it's front feet hit down, one, two. And then there's an airborne phase. And as it flies through the air, it passes those front feet. And then the hind feet land, one, two. And then they push off and they leave a big space in between there. So that is a gallop. It's the fastest motion for most animals to move in. And here's a picture of this. Um, each one of these, this is, a, this is a three by lope. And it just means here's a front foot, front foot, hind foot, hind foot. And they're landing next to the, this one front foot and this hind foot are landing next to each other. So it's not a gallop, it's a lope. Um, but again, that's not critical. But a lot of our, a lot of animals use this. So weasels use this pattern a, a lot. As soon as the snow gets deep, they convert to this two by pattern, like I said, where all four feet are landing in this two tracks and they're launching themselves off out of that. And then this is just another picture of that gallop that I just showed you. So this here, um, if anybody watches our Facebook page, you should have known this was on a track Tuesday, but this is actually a gallop. And the only reason you know, the only way you would know this is a gallop, if you can distinguish the feet, the front feet from the hind feet. So that's why that becomes really important as well. And um, just to back up one second, how do I know these are the front feet and this is the hind feet? I'm, I could just be making that up, but you could also go check your dogs and realize that almost all canines and hoofed animals um, have larger front feet than they do hind feet. So you can just look at the size of those feet and you could you know, like verify that that's the case. So in this case though, these feet aren't that but different, but um, this foot is very symmetrical, very symmetrical. And then this one has one, two, three, four, a big toe right here, staying off way on its own. And the same in this track here, this, this toe, it's almost like your hand with your thumb way down off to the side. And that helps me to know that these are the two front feet of an otter and these are the two hind feet. So I know that it's loping and not doing it something else so <clears throat> okay this is a poll um the question is what family group is depicted in this image and what is the gate And it's a tricky one again, because I don't have any scale in there. This was kind of just an artsy photo, but I thought it'd be good to use. Hmm. All right. It's interesting to see, can you, Jen, can they all see the polls, the poll? I think so. Okay. Um, can you, all you guys out there see the poll? Run. If anybody's having trouble, let me know. I'll give you guys 15 more seconds. 
Okay. Okay, cool. Because we see, I see it tallying up, so I didn't know if everybody was seeing the same thing. All right, this is an important one here. So, um, okay, we good? Wow, time's going by way too fast. <laughs> We're in trouble. Okay, okay, I'm gonna go with it here. So this is a weasel family and they are in a lope. Uh, or you could say it was a bound, but uh, either one. And the reason the, to distinguish that from anything walking or trotting um, is, remember I showed you the left side, the left foot, the right foot, the left foot, the right foot. When an animal is bounding or loping, the line that they form is usually very straight. It may go off a little bit, but there's no clear left side, right side, left side, right side. So you can't mistake this for like a fox or a coyote because that's too straight for them to be doing that. I can't detect any left and a right here. So this is a, actually an ermine trail here, bounding. Um, and, and then it dove into the snow here and burrowed into the snow. And right next to it is another member of the weasel family. This is a mink. And this is a mink bounding in the deep snow. You can see where it drags in a little bit here and here. Um, so, and there's some other weaselish characteristics there that we haven't gone over yet that I'll, I'll show. But if you did, if you saw this one up here, this up here is an old moose walking trail though. So you could get some credit if you were looking at that. Okay, so hopefully that makes some sense. <clears throat> And then the other gates are hopping and bounding uh, or just hopping and bounding. We already talked a little bit about bounding, but um, in hopping and bounding, the rear feet are pushing off and landing simultaneously. So that's just a technical thing. But this is what it looks like. This is a snowshoe hare. This is a flying squirrel actually right here. Um, the two front feet and then the hind feet landing in front, but they land at the same time. The snowshoe hares are the same way right here. Red squirrels are the same way. <clears throat> but you'll notice the the front feet of the hare land at a, separately at an angle and usually tree squirrels the feet land side by side each other and this is just that bounding pattern i showed you with the space between it that's all um <clears throat> if you're going to measure this stuff here's some important measurements the what we call the trail width is from the outside of one the left side of the body to the right side of, or the tracks and the stride length is from one track to where that one foot to where that foot falls again is like the full stride length and those can be important if you're sending in pictures or something and or taking pictures and going home later and trying to figure it out so you definitely want to carry a tape measure everywhere you go i'm not i'm serious about that <laughs> and there's other things to measure like the group length for different animals um, <clears throat> and then the distance in between their bounds or their hops. So when you do take pictures, um, perspective is really important and you need to take pictures with a tape measure and then take them from overall, not just this close because you'll see in this picture, I th that looks like a little kid's shoe or a boot and um, so the further away that I get, um, it still looks like somebody walking here. And it's still they're pretty pigeon toed, but that is a possibility. But in reality, when you get the right perspective, you see the actual size of these tracks and um, with this pigeon toedness and see this, this track here is bigger than this one. This one's bigger than this one. We know that porcupines are pigeon toed. Their hind feet are bigger than the front. So this is a porcupine in an overstep walk. And what happened is it walked down this road after it snowed and it compressed this snow and made it more compact. And all the other snow blew away or it melted or blew away, but it left the harder snow behind leaving this cool trail here. <clears throat> okay, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go through all the characteristics of all these families because we don't have time to do that. Um, but just know that all families have very specific characteristics, which helps you in their identification. Um, <clears throat> we're going to run out of time if I did all this.
here's some pictures of some weasels um, bounding in the snow. This is a least weasel trail. And weasels, when they go in a two, two by bound, their feet land on an angle. And this one isn't exactly, but they usually land on a, a good angle. Even down here, you can see the same thing. That's really important to know in identifying weasel tracks. And it really helpful to distinguish um, least weasels from, believe it or not, voles. Uh, so, and here's another, this is a more typical weasel trail right here, bounding in the snow, and it's crossing a fox trail here. Uh, mink tracks, um, you see they have really, their toes show up pretty clearly. They also, they're a weasel, so they bound and they leave this angle. Um, as soon as the snow gets deep, they go to a two by bound. This is a, this is a mink bounding through fresh, like super powdery, powdery snow. And look at how short those bounds are only like six inches long. So it, they're not designed to go through the deep snow. It was really struggling to get through that snow compared to over here on the hard snow. See how different those tracks are? Martin are designed to float on top of the snow a lot better than a mink, but they have a similar pattern you notice. Their feet are just larger, but they have this two by pattern usually going through the deep snow. Their feet are heavily furred, so you don't really see clear tracks often uh, because of all the furring. And sometimes they walk. And if you've never seen a Martin walk before and you come across this trail, it might throw you off and be like, whoa, what is that? But um, the, stride, the stride length is very short, shorter than most other animals other than um, like some big fat rodents, but notice how narrow the trail is. A big fat rodent would have a much wider trail. Here's some, the best clear Martin tracks you're gonna get because of their furry feet. That's on a dusting of snow on a hard trail. And then they can be underground. They, ha they can be underground. Um, here's trail, so obviously beaten down many times by Martin. <clears throat> we have otters. Um, someone sent me this picture, a friend of mine, and he said this trail went for like two miles out in the mountains off the Denali Highway, and he couldn't figure out what it was, and um, it wasn't near any water. Well, look at this trail. This is an otter sliding, kicking, sliding, kicking, and they will slide and kick for miles. If you ever get an otter hide, hold it up and look at it. The, the legs are about this long. They can't, they can't walk in the deep snow, so they just would, they would high center and just splash around in there. So they push and they slide and they push and they slide. And that's where you get these big dumbbell patterns here in the snow, very characteristic of otter. And you could measure the trail width so you can differentiate it from other animals that might slide. Uh, more otter trails, this is in the hard ground, they will do a lope like other weasels do, like wolverines and such. Sometimes their tail drags, Sometimes it doesn't. Um, wolverines, uh, we have around, uh, of course, sometimes in some places you wouldn't think. They have five toes that usually this toe doesn't show up a lot, so it can be very uh, difficult. The important thing is this pad, this palm pad. It's made up of lumpy, see it's like a C shape, and it's made up of other lumps, lumpy pads formed together. It's very distinctive, and they're usually on their front foot. This proximal pad or this wrist pad shows up. You can see it in the mud right here. Um, those are very telltale signs. They're very large tracks, and sometimes in the snow, you're not going to see all that detail, but you can actually make the pad out here and see the toes barely in there, but you got to use your imagination sometimes. Um, sometimes if you're going down a trail, like I said, that toe doesn't show up. And a lot, I know a lot of people pass these by thinking that they're canine tracks, dog tracks, or maybe even lynx tracks. But um, so you got to look carefully. More um, wolverine tracks, bounding in a three by bound, walking or trotting through the deep snow. They change their, um, they change it up depending on the snow conditions. Um, canines, we have wolves, coyotes, foxes, um, generally, they, they show an X pattern between their toes um, in, their, in their digital space in their pad, and they have a triangular heel pad, except for the red fox, which has this bar-shaped pad, and that's a very important clue for distinguishing red foxes. 
If you can see that bar, then you can narrow it down to red fox. Wolves, lar very large feet. They are very long legged and they have a very long stride length. So the, from this foot to that foot is probably five feet or more. So when people see tracks of dogs, first of all, dogs, there's very rare to have a dog with tracks over four inches. Um, and wolf tracks will be from four up to five and three quarter inches, um, just really massive. But if there's a question, also look at the stride length because wolves have extremely long legs. And this over on this side is an example of a wolf. This is not even a big wolf um, next to a like an 80 pound lab. So you can see the difference in the stride length of this wolf compared to that lab. It's pretty extreme. And that's a good clue to help you out. Just more wolf tracks. Um, wolves trotting through the deep snow. When the snow is extremely deep, they will, like your dog does, they will bound through the deep snow. And it's a massive amount of energy to do that, but I've seen them do um, some amazing bounding through incredibly deep snow. They're very powerful. Coyotes, we have coyotes. Um, you just have to know their length of their tracks, the shape. They have a classic um, X that I was talking about, you could see it in all these. If the shadows are correct, they have a very classic X to them. Um, they're, you know, they're a little more harder to differentiate from huskies than um, than foxes are. So, um, yeah. But the stride length is also important in coyotes differentiating them. They have a longer stride than the red foxes as well. And then there's a red fox. Um, they're all over the place. There's tons of them out there this year. You have to find their trail. They have very clean um, direct register trails or they have track patterns, just very clean. This one is really short um, stride right here. The distance between it's probably walking on a little bit of a crust of snow underneath there. So it's shortening its stride up. And here's that bar, that telltale bar of a red fox. And red fox have very, very furry feet as well. So when they do a direct register walk, it's really hard to see a clean track. It looks like it's been snowed or dusted in a little bit. Um, cats, they don't have that X. They have more of a C-shaped pattern to them. Um, their toes are teardropped. Most cats, um, one helpful thing is that this pad takes up so much of the room, the palm pad, you could fit all the toes into this palm pad. And that becomes a pretty important thing when you're getting misidentifications of um, like cougars and other animals that could look similar to uh, mountain lions. And they have a leading toe, unlike other family groups like canines. So whether you are an African lion or a mountain lion or a house cat, all these animals share that characteristics. <clears throat> except for lynx are a little bit different, of course, because of their furry feet and they have tiny toe pads and a tiny palm pad, but you could still see the leading toe here. You could still see the small pad and that you could never fit all of, well, that's where lynx are different. You can't fit all the toes into that pad. They're an exception in the cat world, but you can see they, uh, the toes with the leading toe. The toes are generally smaller and they have a lot more space in between them than the other cats do also. And their feet are really large. Um, so that's why people mistake them often for, we get reports like, oh, this is a mountain lion track. This is like four and a half inches wide, but people don't realize how big lynx feet are. Um, here's just more lynx walking in the snow. You can see when they walk, you see how wide the trail is. That's what I'm talking about. Knowing the trail width is a really good indicator. And when animals walk, like moose and lynx, they, their trail width is wider than a trotting animal. Lynx also are just like cats. They, this one oh, pooped or put a scat down here and ice, and then it tried, covered it up in the, with snow. Um, this is actually a mountain lion track. You can see how big the palm pad is compared to the other toes. You see the teardrop shaped toes, there's a leading toe. Um, and there's a really clear lobes, like 
cats have three lobes in the back and two lobes in the front, you won't see that in our lynx tracks either. So these are ways to look when people report lynx tracks or uh, mountain lion tracks. Those are the things you need to look at. Okay, I think this is just chat. No, this is a poll. Is it a poll, Jen? Yes, is this a mountain lion? Is anybody still out there? <laughs> I hate this. I can't see anybody. I don't even know if people are still there. <laughs> yes, Jen, we are still, you still there. Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. We, these polls should come with uh, built in Jeopardy music, I think. Yeah. But I no. I hate to think that. Uh, we still I have. I think that I'm talking and there's nobody left out there. Uh, okay. No, there's 96 people still with us. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm going, I have a lot more than I thought I did. I'm, I'm getting there, but uh, yeah, I'm, I might have to speed through a little bit of stuff. Um, probably okay. going to go over an hour, um, but I'll try to go through some things a little quicker and then have some time for some questions. I don't want to leave without questions. Okay, I'm going to end this poll. Okay, end that poll. What do we got? Um, yes, no, maybe. Okay, well, this was just um, not far outside of Nanana. And a couple things about it, just by looking at those tracks right there, I can tell you they're not mountain lion tracks because remember what I showed you, the size of that palm pad in a mountain lion and how all the toes would fit in and the palm pad is way bigger. It has lobes on it showing. Um, this is clearly a lynx track with this wide spacing, really wide track and a very small um, palm pad. This here is the same animal this was thought that, well, maybe that's the tail dragging, but um, mountain lions don't drag their tail. So that's one problem with that. What could that be? Um, I think that it is most likely a, some prey item dragging like out of the mouth of this lynx. And it's, it has a rhythmic sway. So every time that animal steps to the sway is kind of a, a rhythmic. Um, I wasn't at that this scene, so I don't know. I would have went and looked a little bit more, but um, I would say it's probably dragging something out of its mouth. Um, yeah, because even if you look at it, there, it's not even something dragging on its foot. Like if you thought maybe it was had a trap on its foot or something, it's not on a foot. It's not dragging in a foot. It's not hitting that. It's kind of going swaying in between the feet. So um, not a mountain lion. Okay, house cat. When you see house cat tracks, look at them. Um, they're very distinctive. See how clear they're showing up the toes and the pads because they don't have a lot of fur on the bottom of their feet. Otherwise, they have similar characteristics of, of a cat family. Um, rodents, they have, um, we have, there's so many different rodents. I can't get into all of them now, but um, the characteristics, the hind feet have five toes and they have three the three center toes are parallel. So whenever you see three parallel center toes on hind feet, that's a rodent. And then the front feet are hand-like because they usually manipulate items with their hands, no matter what kind of rodent you are. And you could see that in squirrels, beavers, anything. That's just a good clue for you to have. They usually, small rodents bound. These are all red squirrel trails. Uh, people think, oh yeah, I know what a red squirrel looks like, but in the deep snow, compared to the, uh, the less, the um, shallow snow, they change from this two by bound, like a straight two by bound, no angle to it. They drag their feet in and out. This is very classic red squirrel. Here's, another, here's a flying squirrel. Here's a flying squirrel with a sits mark and then it bounds off. Um, here's a squirrel, I can't, I mean, it, it just face planted itself across this big meadow. I have no idea why I did that. Uh, but it's, this is a very unusual squirrel tracks here. Um, I don't know what was going on there. 
Um, big rodents walk. And when they walk, they plow through the snow. They're wide bodied. They have a bit wide trail width, short stride length. They push through the snow usually, whether this is a, this is a woodchuck right here. This is a um, muskrat. This is where a muskrat denned up for a night. See, it melted a nice bowl in the snow. And this one here, pigeon toad again. This is our porcupine walking through the snow. So other rodents like bulls, they just kind of leave, sometimes they leave just these dots in the snow. But if you look closely, you'll see if there's shallow snow, they like to trot or on the hard ground. As soon as the snow gets a little bit deep, like half an inch or so, that I see them start to do a bound, like a squirrel would do it. And when the snow gets really deep, they turn it into a two by bound with a straight, but it's straight across. There's no angle like in the weasel family. Um, shrews and bulls to tell the difference. Shrews, if you remember those pictures that are true, they're so small that the space between their groups of tracks is tiny, usually like an inch compared to a bull that has most bull bulls that I see, the inner space between the groups is um, six inches anyways, and then sometimes eight. But if you look at shrews, they barely have any weight. They make this little stitching appearance in the snow. And between the tracks is usually like an inch or an inch and a half. So that should help you out with that. <clears throat> Hares have giant feet. Um, they, have, they have no pads on their feet. So if you ever see them in the, in the mud or in the ground, usually you just see their claw marks because um, it's just fur and bones. We don't usually see that that often, but um, their tracks, they have giant front, giant back feet, and that's why they call snowshoe hares, and small front feet. They have one of the lowest snow loading of any of our animals out there. That's why they float so well on the snow. Look at how, look at how big those tracks are. That's a lot of surface area for a small animal. And then, Hoofed animals, there's a wide variety. I'm not gonna go into detail on any of these really, but we have the, the important thing is to know that the shape of the hoofs is different on all of our hoofed animals. So you can figure it out by learning the different shapes of the hoofs. And here's an, an example of caribou with the big um, hook shape hoofs and the dew claws showing up here, very wide dew claws, wider than most any other animal except for maybe wild pigs. Uh, because they need all that surface area for where they go in the snow and the tundra. Moose tracks, um, everybody sees those probably. Bison tracks, um, these are actually mountain goat tracks that were um, made in I wet ice or soft ice, and then the wind blew debris into them, and then everything else, and then it froze like that. So it just froze all the debris in the tracks, and all the other debris blew away. Um, this is an important one. I think that everybody should recognize um, it is moose. But the important thing is all over the place, you see that big depression in the ground? That is where a moose bedded down for like a period of hours. And when they get up, they, they get up and then they come out of their bed. They usually leave a big pile of poop somewhere around here after they get up and then they walk out of there. So you should recognize these because um, That'll tell you, I saw a lot of these today when I was out for a walk and, and that's why I ran into a moose because they were all right near the trail. So recognize those and especially if they have a calf with those smaller tracks next to them, then it'll be more heightened. And I'll show you something about the direction of travel. Which way is this animal going? I don't see any tracks, but I can tell you that and I'll show you in a little bit. I'll, I'll just tell you now in case anybody leaves. Um, a couple ways, this animal is traveling towards away the, the way that I'm going this way, to the left and down. How do I know that? Um, one reason, moose always drag their hoofs into the track. See that revert, the cone? It's going into the track. They put their foot in, then they, they step forward and their leg cuts a narrow slot in the snow. Then they pull their foot out, making a bigger hole. This berm of snow, and always in all tracks, snow throw is pushed forward in the track. So just at a glance, you can look at this and say, all right, the moose is coming this way. 
All right, it's, once you get that down, you can do that with other animals as well. Caribou are the same. They, they do a similar thing. They got a shorter stride length. Um, they crater in the snow to eat um, lichen down in this, that's in the, um, on the ground. Birds, um, there's so many, so much variety in birds. This is an awesome uh, great gray owl plunge hole picture from a friend of mine that she shared. Um, other birds, just to suffice to say, because I don't have time to go to, through all of the characteristics, all the different birds have different characteristics that will help you identify them if you want to figure it out. And this is a pigeon right here that did a crash landing on the ice. It didn't realize there was ice there, obviously. Um, how do I know it's a pigeon? One reason is because pigeons have equally length to all the toes are equal length and spread out. So that's just, that's just something um, doves and pigeons have. Other birds like this magpie, I know this is a magpie just by the tail. And there's other ways to know that it's a magpie, but the tail alone indicates that it's a magpie. Raven tracks, um, all, this is a really important thing. All members of the corvid family, which is ravens, crows, jays, and magpies, their two inner toes are hugging together and their outer toe goes off by itself. So this is the left foot, this is the right foot. And then it's just a matter of size. So like, is this a raven? Is it a crow? Is it a jay? Is it a magpie? Um, you can figure all that out if you want to spend the time. Um, grouse and ptarmigan leave all kinds of different sign. This is a hard landing from a, um, sharp, a heavy sharp-tailed grouse. Came in and just came to a screeching halt here. And you could see where its wings were going like cattywampus and trying to maintain its balance when it landed. And then it turned around and walked off in the distance to go eat some whatever it was looking for. They also snow roost. All of our ptarmigan and grouse snow roost when there's deep snow, meaning they burrow into the snow at night and they stay there overnight. And then they break out in the morning and they go feed all day, fill their crops up, and then will go back and burrow to get protection from predators and to get out of the cold. And if you reach in there, you will always find a big pile of scat in there that they left overnight. And why would you want to do that? <laughs> why would you want to reach in there? Because it will help you to identify the bird because you can tell the difference between a rough grouse and a spruce grouse and ptarmigan and sharp-tailed grouse by their scat. So this is one example. This is a very coarse scat. This is from ptarmigan. They have much coarser scat than do the other grouse species. This is a rough grouse next to it. More pictures of ptarmigan and grouse roosting. Um, ptarmigan are just walking around. They're eating little buds off a of willow. See that little bud missing right there? That's all they're doing all day. Um, red poles winding their way through the snow, picking up birch seeds. That's kind of an art. So direction of travel, I already indicated that a little bit. One of them, especially through the snow throw. Um, another way is like through dirt transference. If animals are walking in the dirt, um, they'll leave dirt in the ground and that dirt will slowly dissipate as they walk, as it falls off. So you can look at that and see that. Um, this is just interesting because if you, if you were able to look closely, you could see this pigeon toed walk of a porcupine. It was going up the hill. And every time it got to like a soft snow berm, it had to plow its way through which seems pretty um, pretty harsh for the little porcupine. But, and then over here, the dumbbell shape I said about the weasels, contrast that to this little weasel bounding in these giant leaps coming down the hill, probably mocking the porcupine. Aging tracks, um, and we're getting close to everybody, real close, but you don't wanna miss this aging part. Aging tracks um, is all tied to meteorology. So when you see on TV like, oh, these tracks are like this old and that old, um, a lot of that is kind of just made up. But you, the only way to age tracks is you have to be, you have to be in the area um, and know the weather conditions at, at the time the tracks were made and after the tracks were made. So some tracks that appear old can be very fresh depending on the animal as well. This is a really nice, fresh lynx track, but because of the fur, somebody might interpret that as being old because there's no crispness and clarity to it. 
this is a grizzly bear track on a sandbar, which you might interpret as being old, but if it was windy out, this track, I've seen tracks disappear in uh, minutes. Uh, so you don't know unless you're there or you know the weather that was going on at the time. Um, also, other indicators, like these are all snowshoe hair tracks, all different impressions in depth into the snow because when the springtime, when we start getting some warmth, um, the snow conditions change during the night and during the day. So it hardens at night and it gets softer in the day. So you can determine like when in the cycle this animal was traveling. Um, when we do start getting some solar input, some of the tracks might start melting a little bit larger. There's a lot of misconceptions about melting out of tracks and they don't just suddenly grow larger. There's definitely um, characteristics about them that um, are not just simply a matter of the track getting bigger. This one's getting bigger on this side because the sun is probably coming from over in this way. And it's only melting out the far edge of this track. And uh, there's, there's a bunch of other characteristics that you can learn about. So this so important, what can sintering tell us? Sintering, every time you break snow, um, you change the structure of the flakes or the, basically the structure of that snow. You break it up and then when it, when it comes back together, it bonds back to itself. So that is, the, that is the principle behind making Quincy's and snow caves and everything, that when you mix snow up, it hardens. So what does that mean for aging? Um, what that means is when an animal goes through the snow, this, and this moose coming at us here, it breaks up those crumbles in the snow, they land on top. Within a given period of time, those are gonna bond back to the surface of the snow. And that depends on that depends on a lot of factors like humidity and temperature. But for the most part, what I do is go up to these crumbles here or here where this bowl came out. If you blow on these things and you gotta get down there, just blow on them. If they blow away, they were made very recently. So if you're out ptarmigan hunting, for example, blow on those crumbles. If those crumbles blow away, I would say you're very close to the ptarmigan and you better start, you know, be ready because they could be right around there. And it's the same with moose. If you go up and you see a cow and calf tracks um, off your ski trail or your whatever, you, wherever you're at, and you blow on those crumbles and they blow away, those are very fresh tracks. Unfortunately, after a certain, you know, after several hours, um, and, and depending on where you're from and the conditions of the snow, they can stay that way for a long time. In the interior, we have very little wind in a lot of places and we have no warming conditions. So those tracks can remain crisp and fresh looking for sometimes for weeks. You gotta use other factors too, like time, last snowfall, et cetera. So practicing though, um, is what it's all about. So you can figure out all these little bird tracks and then whether this weasel has a bowl in its mouth or not. And there's a lot of other sign out there. We didn't even talk about scat or other associated sign, which is, a, but there's a tons of it out there. Um, you gotta learn all that too. So hopefully you have a, a long life ahead of you to learn all this stuff. But there's a lot out there and you can't ignore any of it. They all all of it ties into creating these stories that I'm talking about. And there's so much more, but we're out of time and I could go on forever, <laughs> but it's better that you just get out of here and go practice. And that is it. Questions and thank you for showing up tonight. So if you guys could put questions in the chat, Mike can start going through them. I'm going to share my screen really quick and show you guys three things really, um, really fast if you're still with us. Um, let's see. Can you guys see my, the Alaska Department of Fishing Game page? Anybody? Mike, can you see it? I see it on my other screen, um, so I don't know where it's showing yes. up. Yes. Okay, I got a yes. Perfect. Yep. So here's where the track card download lives on this page and that link that I put up in the track. And then um, here's our Vimeo page. You just search on Vimeo for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. So 
When this is done, it'll get added to our list of videos on Vimeo. Similarly, on uh, YouTube, you just search Alaska Department of Fish and Game and then Wildlife Conservation has a channel. You can see one of Mike Track Tuesdays there. So as soon as we post it, it'll be the first one on that link. Thanks, Marjorie. You're so, you're so kind. Okay, so it looks like uh, you have a, is there a visible difference between an adult cow and bull moose? Um, it, yeah, it depends on the age. It's really hard to tell um, cows from um, younger, younger bulls, but when, um, like for larger bulls it is, yes, by the stride length and the size of the hooks, and also in their beds as well, because the size of the beds is different. If you have a really big bull, like, um, and the, the, just the length, the stride length is longer. And I know like, cow, cause there's a lot of cows around. I just step out the stride of cows in snow. I know exactly what it is. And I know it's a long stretch for me um, for one step. So like three and a half feet or three feet to get the one step from a moose. So from a regular cow moose. So if it's anything longer than that, then I know it's probably a big, a bigger bull. And, um, but if it's the same size, it could be um, it could be a, a younger bull moose as well. So it's challenging in the, with the tracks themselves to tell the difference, unless they are a certain size. Hope that makes sense. I have another question for you. How can you tell the difference between a flying squirrel and a regular squirrel? Um, that is, it's challenging to do. Um, they have. Uh, their foot structure is a little, is different. So if you can actually see hind tracks, that is the best way to tell the difference because the a flying squirrel, the hind feet, all of the toes are more are kind of evenly arced across. But on and they have five toes in the back. But on a red squirrel, the three front toes. Remember I told you the parallel are the two outer toes are much shorter than the three center toes. But besides that. Flying squirrels have a very boxy or a square track pattern when they bound, whereas the red squirrels usually have a much more narrow front foot placement. But that said, it can be, it's very difficult because they do, red squirrels do all kinds of weird things, hop, they hop, they bound, and sometimes it can be really challenging. Okay, and then we have another. Can you talk briefly about the difference between ptarmigan and grouse tracks? Yeah, so grouse tracks are generally larger than ptarmigan tracks by a significant amount. Um, this is a ptarmigan track, or this is a ptarmigan foot, and you can see it's a high, it's heavily feathered underneath, and they have very small, shorter toes. So when they when they walk, and it depends on the snow conditions. Um, they leave like kind of a much more blobby lobed track because of all that feathers that are underneath it. And they have a lower snow load because of that. And they, they usually stay up higher for in a given type of snow condition. Whereas grouse, um, they're not very well adapted to deep snow and they plow through it if it's powdery. But you can also check this book out. Uh, Let's see if I can find it in an instant. Um, oh, where is it? Somebody, maybe somebody took it, but that got Mark Elbrock. He has a, uh, a book just about bird tracks as well. It's, and it's a dense book all about bird tracks. So I, I would recommend getting that as well if you're really interested in um, all tracks. I'll go for I'll go for as long as we want. I don't care. I want to find that book. Oh yeah. So here's that book. It's called Bird Tracks and Sign. It's a really really good book. Uh, yeah. Thanks. You still there, Jen? Yep, I'm still here. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> when is the next class, Mike? Um, I don't know. What do you What do you want to do, Marjorie? Like, what would be? 
what would be a good class? Can you do plants again? I know that's hard. I know that's, I, yeah, maybe. Um, uh, plants on Zoom. I got to think about that, how I, how I would pull that off. Pop, I, I probably could. I don't think it might be boring to some people. I don't know. You did all of this on Zoom. It wasn't boring at all. Okay. Well, good. Thanks. I'm glad. <laughs> um, yeah, Fox Tracks. Um, there's a couple things about Fox Tracks. And if you want me to talk for a, a second here, um, they definitely are in, they, they have a very um, clean and narrow um, trail or a track pattern. And they have a, in general about, um, a 12, you know, like 12 inches between the left and the right side. So like a 20, 24, 25, 26 inch stride length if they're trotting. Um, another thing is that um, right now, if you guys, anybody that's around here, like Fairbanks, like I, you got to know all, know what's happened in the snow. We had a big pile of snow. Then we had like a little icing event and a little heavy snow on top of that. And then we had a little more four inches of powder. So if you go out in the powder now on any trails, and if you see tracks that are off in the powder and not breaking through the snow, they're only sinking four inches in the snow. Those are fox tracks. And foxes detect that. Usually you only see that in the spring when we have a freeze thaw. They'll spend all winter on the mushing trails and the ski trails. And as soon as they know that there's a firmness underneath, they start going all over the place. And they're doing that right now but when they do that, they're intentionally being, they're being um, a little more cautious so they don't break through and they're shortening up their, their stride length. And they're only going like bounding through when they're going in, like they sense a bowl and then they start bounding and crashing through like your dog would crash through. But if you see fox tracks on the, on the firm snow and you could see that bar, that is their telltale sign for that pad just having that bar there mike there's another question are okay. you able to use smell to distinguish some species i'm thinking fox and beaver but are there others you can id this way um yeah like fox, there's some urines that have a distinctive scent like fox urine um there's especially like trappers who know the difference between fox urine and some other urine um but in just in in general like, I don't know, I've been on tracking elk and stuff and elk have a, de a definite smell and you can, you, you could smell them in the air when they're near you and whether they've been in a bed, you could smell the elk in the bed. Um, so yes, and there's probably more of that that I'm aware of right now that I can answer you right off the cuff with that. Uh, <clears throat> Does an yeah. owl pouncing look Washington's like a, a, oops, sorry. Washington's a pretty cool place too. There's a lot of tracking opportunities in Washington. Mike, there's another question. Does an owl pouncing look like a fox pouncing? Uh, no, no, it doesn't. Um, um, basically because um, they, you know, they do it differently. Owls coming in from the air and it's basically plunging in with its feet and its face. So, um, and then you'll usually, you know, if they're doing that in the powdery snow, you'll, when they take off or when they'll, they'll have wing impressions in the snow. Um, so they don't, they don't look the same because they're missing the, the trail up to the pouncing event. You've got another one. What's the most surprising or out of place track you've ever seen? Oh, is this a trick question? <laughs> um, well, sometimes I, people try to trick me sometimes. So I had some friends one time, I was at a birthday party and they, they, they said there were some weird tracks outside and I went out and looked and there was actually an elephant dung sitting out on a trail and then big elephant tracks going through the woods that I continued to follow and realized that it was fake because they disappeared at the road. So that was a little bit weird. <laughs> and it was a real elephant dung 
brought up from a zoo. That's it's crazy. Yeah. I'm guessing that was not Alaska. No, it was Alaska. <laughs> That's why it's crazy. <laughs> but uh, there, there's other things when you when you're out and get it's you get really get taken by surprise and your mind doesn't your mind won't process some things and um i was in the desert washington eastern washington one time and we were tracking deer you know practice trailing deer and we came across these tracks and this uh friend of mine he was like he asked a couple of us what are those and i looked at them and i knew what they were somewhere in my head i knew what they were but I was out in this, what I thought was the middle of a desert-ish scrub desert. So I couldn't come up with anything. So I said a badger. And, and, and he's like, look at those again. What is that? And we all were just kind of dumbfounded. And the reality was that it was an otter. And unbeknownst to us, there was like a hold, there were some holding tanks nearby. Where, and that otter was basically living around these water holding areas. And, um, so th that's just kind of the mentality of things is where you know you need to focus on the actual tracks and the morphology and everything that you know and trying to exclude all that other stuff is um, sometimes really hard so if you have a really strange track it could be real but you could discount it based on nothing concrete so it happens I'd like to see some out of place mountain lion tracks around here, like everybody reports. <clears throat> Anything else? Everybody? And, and I like I was out today. I learned, I know I learned a lot of stuff just today, like every time. There's no, there's no end to like learning things out there all the time. There's always something some nuance to learn. Okay, hey, two more questions. I saw some otter tracks in Goldstream recently. How do otters yeah. make it through interior winters and do the otters in Goldstream have to make it to the Chena for the winter? Um, yeah, they, um, oh, they make it through great. They live under the ice most of the time there and they eat fish and other, other animals and um, come to the surface, make a bunch of cool tracks as well, travel overland. Um, but they're all over the interior, all, all over, you know. And uh, when, the, when, when winter comes and we have a, ice forms on the top, the water levels drop. So between the ice and the water, there's also a lot of dry land on the edges of the river as well underneath there. So it's not like when they go under there, uh, they're just in the water. They, they can be up on the dry land under the ice shelf. Follow up. So the otters stay in Goldstream Creek. Yes, as long as there's food, they very well could do that. Yep. Another question: Have you picked up any of the mule deer tracks around the Taylor Highway? Um, uh, along the Taylor, um, I have not. I mean, we we have had some deer tracks sent in here, pictures. Uh, over the, you know over the last few years um i haven't been down that way so i haven't seen any um so no and i haven't seen any pictures coming in of any deer tracks lately uh, somebody somebody sent some in so they thought were deer tracks uh, but the quality and the, the 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 perspective of the pictures wasn't wasn't good enough to um make any kind of confident decision on that you know i i need a people need to follow it and get more pictures i could have told that person uh, immediately whether they were deer tracks if they had gotten me the stride length of that animal in the deep snow because i think it was a moose but i couldn't see anything because i didn't have any um measurements or any good pictures of the, the track pattern in the snow and the snow is deep and deer are not going to just leave footholds in the snow. They're going to be dragging through the snow. So you got to, I don't know. Yeah. We 
We still Anything have else? almost 50 people out there. I know there's more questions. Nate, you got a question? <laughs> Okay, I can just make some stuff up. <laughs> okay, one. <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> make stuff up. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, we know we know there's deer. Yeah, crossing over. Um, there's been reports of them in sightings. So we 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 actually have a new. Uh, regulation for harvesting any deer that is seen coming over the border that could be uh, harvested. So you can see that in the fishing game regulations right now. And there have been some dead ones found and they've been pictures of them reported all the way up close to Fairbanks, North Pole, Salcha, um, even towards Nanana. Uh, yeah, so not a lot, but maybe one every year or something like that. There's a question, oh. pressure, <laughs> pressure testing snow tracks as far as the age and size of an animal. Um, well, pressure testing. Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. Um, so I like it, the, the snow conditions, like any given animal, um, the snow conditions are, they change and they're so variable that each animal is going to have that variation along with the snow condition, you know, uh, but there is definitely some relativeness there depending on the animal. Some animals are very highly adapted and they have a very low snow load, you know, pressure load, regardless of what kind of snow it is. And some animals have a very high pressure load that no matter what the snow condition is. Um, yeah. So no, it's, it depends again on the snow. Like if you put your finger in the track, it really depends on the snow condition. If it's wet, hard snow, um, that may be, that might be a helpful thing. And sometimes you can actually reach in there. If I was down in Juneau, sometimes I've dug down through the powdery snow and reached down in the bottom and brushed all the snow away. And you can actually see a real track in the bottom of that snow that got compressed. Um, you can't do that around in the interior most of the time because the powder is so powdery that the snow is so powdery, it never gets a good chance to form a good track down there. Um, you know that app will not just tell you that. Um, it, you have to still like figure things out. <laughs> but there are some people, um, I just read some things um, that there is somebody trying to work on an app like they I, they have those i naturals plant apps now that apparently you can put on a uh plant and it will tell you what it is i don't it's not 100 percent accurate but there is not one of those for tracks right now that i know of but you got to do it the old-fashioned way <laughs> there's another question if you see only baby moose tracks with no other large tracks around does it mean that it's an orphan um I guess it depends on how hard you look, you know, but yeah, possibly there's, they're usually not that far apart, but you can't, you can't just like see calf tracks. You'd have to really look around a bit. And, um, but if, if there's continuously calf tracks without any cows, I would say that's pretty highly unusual that they don't interact or cross trails. They usually feed fairly close together. I've seen, a, I don't know what it is about around Fairbanks area, but I've, I've seen, I've actually seen a few cows with calves um, in the last few days. Tra cow and calf tracks everywhere. Um, it's really interesting. So you got yeah, an is image. There size, um, is there size overlap? Uh, there, you know, I would, I would actually have to look that up to uh, be a hundred percent on that, but um, between an ermine and a least weasel tracks, my rule of thumb for that is on a trail width for a two by bound, 
um, that an, a least weasel trail, the trail width from the left side to the right side with those two tra angular tracks is about an inch. Ermin is usually an inch and a half or larger up to two and a half or so inches. So I don't go by the individual feet because you rarely see those, but I'd go by the trail width of those animals. There's a question about what this is. What is that? <laughs> um, I'm not sure what that is, just based on that one picture. I don't like saying, I don't like saying what, what something is just by looking at one picture. Um, I would have to look at that a little bit more thoroughly, but I see a walking, a wide trail with a drag down the middle, right? And I don't have any scale for it. So I would be reluctant to just shout out an answer on that one. Maybe, maybe somebody else will. But it looks like a very wide trail. Do you know what, does it, do you know what it is? It says uh, the drag is a couple inches wide. Hmm. And next time she'll take more photos. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Or send, mail, email me some, if you had any more photos. Yeah, I'm not sure what that is. Like, it doesn't make sense for a couple of things that you might think, like porcupine. If that snow is powdery, there, this thing is not um, having any foot drags. And, um, it, it, and it could be an animal literally dragging something through the snow. Um, I can't tell enough from this, uh, yeah. <laughs> I think we've I, I reached the, chat. uh, oh, sorry, here, I can stop sharing. You probably. Um, uh, hang out in their snow castle. Um, well, one, put a trail camera in there. This is for Marjorie. I think there's some animal your kids think this one coming in the snow castle is there any scat in there um you can put a trail camera in there and try to get some pictures of it or just clean the snow around the entrance to it or whatever and see what kind of tracks are out there in the morning or then whenever can you tell caribou poop from doll sheep scat um yeah, I was. I, I want to say it's similar, but uh, yes. But it's um, it can be close looking. I have both. I actually collected both of them this fall just because of that, uh, just to have them to compare. But they are close, though. Um, settle age old question of why the chicken crossed the road. <laughs> um, I, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of times where we have gone out and looked at reports of things, you know, like wolves in the neighborhood or, uh, mountain lion tracks or whatever it may be. So, yeah, there's definitely times when people go out and look at things to uh, try to validate or invalidate somebody's observations. Yeah. Uh, how can we? Uh, yeah, I don't know how you track fish, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I am wombat. Poop is cubicle. That is a very interesting, and a lot of things about scat. You know, we we didn't get a chance to talk about scat, but um, that's a very important aspect of this too. Every animal has a pretty distinctive scat, so that's other evidence that you should, if you follow tracks and can find scat, is to get some evidence of that, um, either pictures or collect it. Uh, 
Um, I, I, yeah, I don't know. We, we're going to talk about some more Zoom classes coming up. So if anybody has any particular ones that they want to throw out, then you could send either Jen or I an email and we'll consider that just a, a, it's a matter of interest, you know, so. Um, I'm not sure about the wood bison surveys. Um, those are aerial surveys um, that we just had a report posted about the last one that we did and the numbers and everything. We posted a updated on Facebook and on our website. So there is an update on that out there just from about a month ago, I believe. All right. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks again, everybody. Um, yeah. If there's a, a lot of interest, you know, I, like I say, going on the field and learning this stuff is there's no um, substitute for that. You know, we call it dirt time, getting out and looking, and it really does help. You know, I I prefer to do some classes uh, with people in person, and if we get ever the go ahead to COVID gets under control, we'll do some outdoor. Uh, we do them through Alaskans Afield. And some, I know some of you have been in some of those classes, but um, we, we go out in the field and look at some of this stuff, um, you know, but any given with tracks and sign, there's such a, it's such a voluminous thing and variation. Um, you literally can go out a million times and you're still going to be seeking answer, you know, looking for answers to stuff. So um, every time you go out, you can just cover a little bit of stuff, but that all adds up over time. So hopefully we'll be back in that situation pretty soon and we can go out and do some stuff outside. <laughs>